So I'm Kamaljeet. The topic for my talk is cultural ecosystem services, um, a key to address pressing environmental concerns of climate change and biodiversity decline. Before I proceed, I would like to pay my respect to the traditional owners of Larakia Nation here in Darwin and also to indigenous peoples and local communities across the globe who have been managing our natural resources uh, very wisely that enables us to access many ecosystem services that we enjoy today. My name is Kamaljeet Senga. Uh, I work at the Darwin Center for Bushfire Research at Charles Darwin University here in Darwin, Australia. Um, I work as a senior ecological economist and we live in the very tropical parts, part of the world where we enjoy a lot outdoor life. Originally, I come uh, from a farming family in the state of Punjab. Um, it's up here in the foothills of Himalayas. Uh, this part is part, uh, this land is part of the great Gangetic Plains where people have been cultivating land for thousands of years. Um, and it, was, it has been the hub of green revolution since 1960s to uh, fulfill the grain demand for Indian population. Uh, and it's called the food bowl of India. As you'll see in these pictures, uh, it's a typical agricultural landscape, but people uh, do this agriculture as their heritage. Um, there are special norms, uh, traditions, the way uh, you cultivate your land and people sit under these big trees quite often. You s this picture is very common. The reason I'm saying this is there are currently mass protests happening uh, by the farmers against Indian government's recent bills, which are supporting corporations. You may have seen some of these news on BBC, CNN. Uh, agriculture is actually people's heritage in this case, and I wanted to highlight that it's not a private business. And that's quite often the case uh, that many local and indigenous communities are mistaken for. Uh, they are struggling for their rights to land everywhere across the world. Uh, and often governments and policymakers, they fail to understand the true value of indigenous peoples and local communities managed lands. And that's the irony of uh, the modern world. So for my talk, uh, a brief outline is that I'll go through what cultural ecosystem services are, what's the role of indigenous and local communities in managing their lands. Quite often these are addressed at, uh, as IPLCs. What are the benefits of IPLC's managed lands to the wider public? What are the challenges for indigenous peoples and local communities? And what can be the solutions? How can we make this world a better place? So first, starting with world uh, cultural ecosystem services, there is a common definition um, that's, uh, that cultural ecosystem services are non-material benefits people obtain from, from nature. It includes the creation, aesthetic enjoyment, physical and mental health benefits, spiritual experience, education, whatever you want to name that hasn't got any material attached to it. Or uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005 have also defined cultural ecosystem services, expanding the IUCN definition that I gave here about a little bit further into heritage values and knowledge that people inherit managing their landscapes. So I guess uh, Millennium Assessment uh, Framework in 2005, which was first released in 2003, was the first of its kind that highlighted the four types of ecosystem services and among them brought the cultural ecosystem services to the forefront uh, and linking those cultural ecosystem services to the constituents of human well-being. So they, the, the, the group of about more than 1300 scientists across the globe for the first time linked these cultural ecosystem services, which could be spiritual, educational, recreational, to the well-being constituents such as security, basic materials for good life, health, good social relations. So the main thing in this framework is it suggests this one-way relationship 
And that's one of the key I want to highlight in my talk today, that when people are managing their landscapes, they are obtaining their cultural ecosystem services. services. It's a two-way relationship, and I will be explaining that uh, a little bit uh, further. So in 2015, uh, Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services proposed another framework, <clears throat> which used a bit simpler terminology. So saying nature, which includes biodiversity and ecosystems or mother earth or systems of life. And then people obtain nature's benefits, which are essentially ecosystem goods and services. And that enhances people's well-being, which is their quality of life. So again, in this framework, you will see there is this one-way relationship. And from indigenous peoples and local communities perspective, it, is, it has always been that two-way relationship, not one-way relationship. So defining from my own perspective, cultural ecosystem services are indeed both material and non-material benefits. That includes goods and services that people obtain from their natural systems for cultural purposes. The reason I'm saying that is because the material benefits are those which are culture related items. For example, bark used for cultural purposes, uh, ochre used for cultural purposes uh, as a paint to dance, special wood material that's used to uh, craft some ornaments. And obviously, there are many non-material benefits, such as knowledge, experience, people's aspirations. You get inspiration as well from looking at nature, aesthetic values. There are many spiritual and religious values. <clears throat> so some examples of material benefits is ochre that comes from stones, sandstones, and sometimes roots of some plants. And it's a common practice among the indigenous people here in Northern Australia that uh, the ochre from a particular place, particular type is used for their dancing ceremonies, for their ceremonies and to perform dances. So especially dance instruments, clap sticks, bo boomerangs, uh, some didgeridoos, they're made from wood of certain species. And you can see the paint with ochre as well. Uh, there are obviously non-material uh, benefits such as sacred and ritual values um, are got uh, are the most important sacred site here in Australia, Uluru, in Central Australia. Uh, this is another example where a totem is engraved um, on this tree. Uh, the other examples I'm giving here is uh, uh, the sacred groves in India, which I have seen since my childhood. They've been common throughout India, but more, most, more so in southern part of India. The sacred groves are small areas of land where forest is protected for a deity or for a goddess. And quite often these are just the monuments like a stone or even a, a little structure or little hut made by people to worship the deity. But these days uh, people have been constructing some small sized temples in those sacred groves. So a typical sacred grove looks like this with lots of trees around it and a little place to worship. The other way of looking at cultural ecosystem services is that uh, in, in, in Australia, indigenous people have been using totems. Totem is like you can attach um, an animal or a plant to a person. So it becomes a responsibility of that person to look after or protect that particular plant or species. Uh, it's, a common, uh, uh, it's a common thing among many indigenous Australians. Uh, it's uh, among, in case of people's social life, there are clan and kinship relationships where those kinship relationships are actually defined by the land. So what we call clan land or traditional land, where people work out with each other, which land you come from and what's your relationship with that particular person, he or she. And it also defines learning on their country. Uh, so I'm using the word country. Country 
here is common term again in northern australia in, in australia where people have familial or traditional relationships with their clan lands so another activity that people do here in northern australia is cleansing the country uh, which is uh, actually uh, using fire but using fire in a way that you have small petty and cool burns across the country what it does is it protects the landscape from wild big fires which can burn thousands and thousands of square kilometers so applying these cool burns uh, what we call uh, uh, cleansing the country is actually helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and this has led to a very innovative economy what we call carbon economy in northern australia so in in managing the landscape indigenous peoples and local communities have had this two way relationship with their natural environment and this two way relationship is what shapes our landscape depending on our needs and use of resources based off my work over the last 20 years here in northern australia and also uh, from uh, working with uh, small scale landholders uh, in or local communities in india we have come up with this uh, framework where we try to explain this two way relationship how it works for indigenous peoples and local communities so the green box here actually defines the uh, landscape in which people live in so people's lifestyle is totally embedded in the landscape so country is what we call land systems or the natural systems where people got access to land and country and people have this two way relationship so people's living or their well-being in modern terms is directly related to how is their country being looked after so to look after their country people got specific cultural norms and ceremonies which have evolved over millennia and those cultural norms and ceremonies they actually equate to this duty of care for ecosystems in modern terms what we call environmental management so and that led, leads people to care for their country and that actually leads to their governance and by doing so so people looking after their country enhancing their well-being and sustenance uh, and practicing their cultural norms and ceremonies delivers a lot of biophysical ecosystem services apart from social cultural services or cultural services in this case in addition to enabling people to continue their knowledge and skills uh, to learn that knowledge and skill their knowledge and skills in managing natural resources as well as to pass on that knowledge to future generations so the capabilities are the key here and people's norms and ceremonies are, are the key as well so if we don't have the cycle going on we lose people's knowledge and skills what we call in formal language people's capabilities that enable people to drive their well-being benefits from managing their country so the cultural norms and ceremonies are the underpinning uh, uh, underpinning uh, uh, things in this case that enable people to gain their capabilities and to obtain cultural ecosystem services so when we look at the global picture indigenous peoples and local communities represent about 2.5 billion people among them 370 million people are indigenous and they are living across 90 countries representing about 5000 different cultures so all together they manage about 50% of the global land mass and most of this land mass is managed communally so what this means is if this 50% of the land mass is looked after by people while maintaining their cultural ecosystem services and performing their cultural ceremonies there is going to be a huge diversity on this planet earth we need to come up with the with the ways to understand the importance of this uh, indigenous peoples and local communities managed landscape 
that actually delivers not just but not not one but multiple ecosystem services uh, which benefits not the indigenous peoples themselves but many non-indigenous people living across the globe so one critical element for indigenous peoples and local communities uh, land management is that people have direct cultural connections with their natural landscapes so the direct cultural connections what i mean is there is such a sense of intimacy, closeness with the natural systems. You feel embedded in the system uh, and, and your life revolves around those systems. Uh, so I have seen talking with indigenous people here in Northern Australia, seen people crying for their land when it's not being looked after. And it happens to many older peoples back in India as well, where they want to keep their landscape healthy. So it's uh, it's uh, people. It could be people's one-to-one -one relationship with their landscape, or it could be the entire society or clan attached to that that particular part of the landscape. So, and this kind of attachment could be inspirational, emotional, spiritual, educational, uh, mental, uh, health health related. But cultural norms and laws are the underpinning uh, attributes that enable people to have those cultural connections to keep them alive, to keep them going, and to actually keep looking after their landscape in a continuity. Uh, so, and this system has been eroding day by day due to modernization and pressure for development. But from a policy perspective, there is need to understand the importance of people having cultural connections with their natural landscapes. I'm giving an example of uh, this Ganges, uh, uh, the river Ganga, which is called Ganga, Ganga Ma, um, uh, doing prayer on the river banks. Um, I, I happened to visit this place in 2017, 2018, sorry, and being part of this ceremony. It is such a moving experience where people sit together on the banks of River Ganges, uh, Ganges and they pray. This is Lord Shiva's statue, very big statue there, and saying that we need to look after our River Ganges. Uh, unfortunately, due to development pressure and cooperations, they've been exploiting most of the gang Ganges and there has been an enormous amount of pollution throughout the uh, river where it flows. But this happens in Rishikesh, where people sit together and you still see the pure water flowing um, in, in the river. In contrast, when we look at modern societal perspective, we see nature as a resource, as a resource. Um, and when we talk about there, there is uh, a lot more awareness about the environment now. But even then, when we talk about the environment, it's mostly about obtaining benefits from nature. We have nothing similar to the cultural norms that indigenous and local communities have had over the centuries. So when we talk about cultural ecosystem services from modern perspective, so it's about mostly obtaining benefits, whether that's recreation, aesthetic or educational. So what I want to highlight here is that it's again, one way relationship. And the majority of us, we lack that duty of care or the responsibility that we need to have for our natural environment. Even if we take one part of a little, uh, uh, landscape or a park somewhere that I'm responsible to actually look after this part of the park. Um, but it doesn't happen because we assign duties to the government servants, whether they look after it or not. We don't have that personal one-to-one -one connection. And we don't have that due to lack of those cultural norms. Uh, we often don't have any emotional attachment and what it leads to leads to monocultures of our landscapes. So, which is very unfortunate. Um, but the good thing is 
with environmental uh, in, environment with awareness for the environment in modern times people are becoming much more aware of why environment is is important for for us to live on this planet earth and i guess if we take it one step further we develop those cultural norms at a societal or individual level we can progress much more further to protect our environment from uh, degradation, decline, biodiversity, or climate change. From indigenous peoples and local communities' uh, perspective, I want to highlight the benefits of their managed lands. So from IPLC's perspective, it's a much more holistic and integrated management of the landscape, which actually delivers multiple ecosystem services for the wider public which we don't realize. So for example, here indigenous people in Northern Australia are managing their landscape by applying those small patchy cool burns across the landscape. They reduce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that would have otherwise been emitted to the atmosphere. So with, with this, um, what we call Savannah burning technology now, it's, it's been recognized by the government Australia has been significantly able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from wildfires. Uh, usually these greenhouse gas emissions contribute about 4% to our national inventory. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions is one thing, but it also applying those small cool burns also helps to protect biodiversity. So there are significant biodiversity benefits, which are not just to these local people here, but also to, to regional and global populations. So applying integrated management, it helps to reverse biodiversity decline. Because the other side is that different people will value and care for different components of a landscape. That gives us a lot of scope for enhancing diversity within the landscape. Imagine a landscape where uh, different patches are managed by different people or, or you, you think about a national park where different patches are managed by different parts of uh, the population uh, for, for people and they're having that relationship with that landscape. So they're, they're doing their best to enhance the diversity of that landscape. And there is a micro scale management of natural resources in this case, because people are looking at a very fine scale. And uh, uh, this kind of management, it leads to revival of traditional ecological knowledge. So that means that, that the traditional ecological knowledge uh, can be practiced, it can be exchanged and passed on to future generations, which is one of the largest concern for many indigenous peoples and local communities across the globe. And above all, it help us, helps us to achieve sustainable development but in harmony with nature. So coming to India, the sacred groups in India, they play a bigger role, uh, a really big role in preserving biodiversity. So there are about 1,300, more than 13,000 sacred groves across India. And I have already tried to describe sacred groves that usually you will have uh, a monument they're dedicated to a deity with with lots of trees around that space and quite often that monument or uh, the place that's dedicated to the deity will incl include diverse trees diverse uh, uh, plant species and they're usually protected uh, and managed by the local people or the clan responsible to look after that uh, place of that deity, that sacred grove. And these sacred groves are spread all over India. Uh, they cover an area of about 33,000 hectares. There are some recent figures where people are saying there are about 100,000 groves actually, small and large. The size could vary from 0 0.1 hectare to about 100 hectares. Um, and these, these sacred groves, they represent sanctuaries of wildlife. Uh, because otherwise, in a place like India, where forest cover is declining at a very fast rate, uh, 
these uh, without sacred groves uh, it's very hard to imagine the diversity that exists across the landscape and so these sacred groves play a vital role to to maintain biodiversity all across india and i must highlight that there is a micro level management like the people because people have got their place best placed based values so they manage according to their geography according to their cultural norms according to their learning systems that they inherit from their elders and according to the climate they live in so it's a very fine scale management um, and that fine scale management actually enables people to maintain those sacred groves and to deliver many many ecosystem services and cultural ecosystem services are one of them this is an another example uh, just to provide you an overview how cultural uh, uh, how these sacred groves look like when we looked at a bigger picture from a landscape perspective um, you can imagine this whole landscape filled up with sacred groves which are looked after by people for their own well-being and managed by people so it's about empowering people and making the policy makers realize the importance of these sacred groves <clears throat> similarly in the northern territory australia which is up here and this is the northern territory map <clears throat> we have more than 8000 archaeological sites with hundreds of sacred sites uh, so you can imagine that all these sites managed by the indigenous clans all across the australian landscape and people have got uh, their song lines which are essentially like the dream tracks where people uh, they they talk about their cultural sites on the way they sing their songs and they perform ceremonies so the song lines are are, are, are traditional traditionally managed by people Uh, in a way that it helps to connect one country with another country and also to pass on their ceremonies and cultural norms while they are traveling from one place to another so overall so these are some of the examples of those song lines where people walk and they uh, they talk about their ceremonies so essentially what i feel that that the entire australian landscape is is a cultural landscape and we can imagine if this whole cultural landscape is managed by indigenous clans it will be biodiversity rich continent on earth uh, the way the people if people are enabled to look after their lands to manage uh, their cultural sites sacred sites so based on our understanding um, i have come up with a cultural ecosystem services framework where we can imagine the similar kind of framework i proposed earlier but this time uh, just just relating it to cultural ecosystem services if we think there are sacred cultural sites across the landscape similar kind of these things all across the landscape and we see that people got these very specific place ba based two way relationships with their landscape and these cultural sites they are then connected through their song lines across the landscape what it does is uh, that it enables people to continue their cultural practices norms and ceremonies so having people practicing their norms and ceremonies enables people to build their capabilities and knowledges that then further helps them to drive socio cultural goods and services which include people's capabilities people's experiences such as spiritual inspirational and their connectedness to the landscape um, the goods that people obtain from their landscape uh, for art and craft and people's identities it's the sense of belongingness it's the sense of place that actually gives them a bigger feeling about their well being in addition to all these benefits uh, there are biophysical ecosystem services for the wider public so but all these this kind of setting these change due to political and socio economic influences 
and these cultural connections also evolve over, over time. The need for the modern uh, uh, times is that we need to actually understand the importance of these cultural practices, norms and ceremonies, that how enabling people to look after their cultural sites helps deliver many ecosystem services for the indigenous peoples and local communities, and also ecosystem services for the wider public, which are much needed to mitigate climate change and biodiversity decline. However, we have many challenges, um, and I'm listing just a few. Uh, assessing the true value of IPLC managed lands, from my perspective, is a big challenge. And that's why, as I showed earlier, that Indian farmers in, in, uh, in India has been uh, sitting on this protest for the last more than two months, demanding for their rights to land, saving their land from corporations. So the, the failure here to me is that our governments and the policymakers, they have not been able to understand what is the true value of indigenous peoples and local communities managed lands. Sporting IPLC's land management is another key challenge. Um, we don't have any specific mechanisms how we support people uh, to be able to continue their practices and certainly land rights and recognition of indigenous land rights at the local, regional and global level is a big challenge. It's a big issue across the globe. But how can we address some of these challenges? Not all. Now, obviously, it's a big thing and needs a global effort. Um, in, in Northern Australia, the indigenous people have land rights, rights to land about 80% of this total area in one form or the other. Uh, mostly um, in the Northern Territory, uh, the place where I live in here in Darwin, uh, people have access to freehold land, about 60% of the total Northern Territory uh, land area. Elsewhere, uh, people have this native title that could be exclusive or inclusive. Um, and overall, uh, indigenous land rights, they comprise uh, about 80% of the total rights to land uh, uh, in, in the North. And most importantly, indigenous communities are distributed all across the landscape. As I've been talking about those place-based place -based values or the specific micro level management. So despite colonization over the last 200 years, People are dispersed all across the landscape, unlike many non-Indigenous communities which are settled here in Darwin or Townsville or Mackay or Broome here, uh, the major cities in Northern Australia. Uh, these people are dispersed all across the landscape and uh, have still retained their connections to some degree uh, to look after their cultural and sacred sites. So assessing the value of uh, indigenously managed lands is another uh, challenge. Uh, so we conducted a study of uh, this indigenous estate called Fish River Station, which is about 180,000 hectares in Northern Australia. Uh, and we looked at the social cultural benefits applying a well-being approach. And we also looked at people's capabilities that they are able to maintain and able to pass on to their future generations. Uh, this particular property is very rich in biodiversity values. So when we look at the well-being benefits or the social cultural cultural benefits that people obtain from managing this particular indigenous estate, they are worth about $2.2 million, but they don't they are not accounted in any policy decision making. The another case study we looked at understanding the links between wild resources and Aboriginal well-being is in the wet tropics in North Queensland. So we worked with Mullen, Mullenbara Dengi people in the wet tropics, uh, which is up here. Um, and we, we conducted some focus group meet, meetings with the elders there. And we ranked the benefits that people get from maintaining their cultural sites in that part of the world. And males mostly 
and females, they all highlighted these spiritual, cultural, and identity values, including language and tools. One of the things that women particularly were interested in is uh, this transfer of knowledge, that these cultural sites enable them to transfer their knowledge. And it is a, it is a big issue for many um, indigenous uh, uh, people across Australia, that how we can transfer our knowledge to the younger generations how we can train our future traditional owners. Some of the solutions to all these problems is that we need to support with IPLC land management. We need to actually develop some sporting mechanisms. Uh, before that, we also need to inform policy decision-making, the importance of managing uh, land, following indigenous uh, and local communities practices. So developing payments for ecosystem services is one such mechanism. Um, and I think if we follow this payment for ecosystem services kind of uh, uh, mechanism, we can mitigate uh, and look after, the, we can mitigate uh, biodiversity decline, uh, we can mitigate climate change, and we can manage the country in a much better and refined way. And managing this country, I'm putting this example here from Northern Australian perspective, where we got fire as a major issue. So fire management, natural hazard, uh, managing this natural hazard is a big thing. Um, and building people's resilience to these natural hazards uh, is a key concern for the Australian government as well as the state and territory governments across the North. Uh, so hence, we develop this kind of payments for ecosystem services kind of uh, outline mechanism where if we invest in uh, people looking after country applying those small cool patchy burns early in the dry season uh, when we don't have much fuel load in the landscape that saves the landscape from late dry season uh, fires, which are often wildfires spreading across thousands of kilometers. So enabling people to do that through providing them financial support helps them, helps people to, to develop some regional economies, to build their capacity to ma manage natural hazards. It enhances people's resilience, enables people to maintain their cultural, natural, social and built assets and hence our uh, sustainable ecosystems. Uh, so the similar way, uh, whatever uh, natural assets we have got, if we enable our uh, indigenous peoples and local communities to look after those assets, they deliver, they maintain those services from those natural assets. And also they deliver many biophysical services uh, that are uh, important for our survival on, our planet Earth. In this whole situation, what I'm thinking is that cultural ecosystem services can play, can play a pivotal role. Uh, the reason for cultural ecosystem services to be playing a pivotal role is because the cultural ecosystem services are the ones where people can actually directly con con connect themselves with their natural landscape. They can they can intimate with their landscape. They can relate directly to their landscape. So if we target cultural ecosystem services from policy uh, perspective, we can achieve our results for mitigating climate change or biodiversity decline at a much fa faster rate. The other thing uh, is that we need to mainstream cultural ecosystem services into policy decision making. And to mainstream these ecosystem services, we need multiple knowledge systems for informing policy decision making. And those multiple knowledge systems could be value assessments, indigenous knowledges and local knowledge, social knowledge, scientific knowledge. And if we put it all together, I'm sure that we will be coming up with nicely designed programs that help us to achieve the best. And I would like to thank you all. Uh, and if there are any questions, I will be there in the question hour. Thank you, bye.